Hello my friends, today we are going to discuss our new chapter that is heat transfer fluids. So, uh, before going to start about that heat transfer fluids, just let us know that actually where we are using this heat transfer fluids. Basically, if you remember that I have already shown this image in my earlier lectures. So, basically in the solar thermal systems what is happening? So, when the sunlight is coming to the systems, that sunlight is converting into the heat energy and then into the electricity. So, that means if you remember in my last lecture, I have discussed that when the solar energy is coming onto some panels or maybe some pipes or maybe some other uh, containers. So, basically inside that containers either we are putting some kind of gas or maybe the air or maybe some kind of liquids. So, now that liquid is getting heated by that sunlight and then that heated liquid we are using as a vapor and then we are running the turbines and from that we are generating the electricity. So, basically that is the concept. So, that is why today basically we are going to discuss about that particular heat transfer fluids. So, the thermal energy is delivered to heat transfer fluids in short as I told already it is HTF through convections and also be accomplished in less traditional ways like radiation and the conduction. So, basically the convection principle is working over here. The HTF needs to collect, transport and exchange heat obtained from the solar radiations. This heat is used to convert the water into steam as I told already. So, through that pipe sunlight is coming over here and then that heat transfer fluid HTF is going through these channels and through the convection process it is getting heated up and then we are increasing that heat in up to certain level. So, that this liquid is converting into the steam and then that steam directly going to the turbine and then generator is coupled with the turbine. So, when the turbine will blade will rotate, so automatically the generator will be rotating and then from that generator we are going to get the electricity. So, that is the whole concept over here. So, the heat is also stored for generating electricity at night time or maybe in the cloudy weather or maybe into the rainy season. So, there are several types of heat transfer fluids are available like oils like thermal VP1, these all are the different grades name actually basically Duratherm 600, then Siltherm XLT, then Dautherm L, then there are certain kinds of molten salt also available like solar salt, sodium nitrite and the potassium nitrite combinations, lithium sodium, potassium carbonates, lithium potassium sodium fluorides or maybe the carbonates. So, like this way some kind of special liquids are also available like ionic liquids and the some kind of liquid metals, some kind of pressurized gas like air it is from 30 to 100 bar carbon dioxide or nitrogen and of course, the last one is the steam that means the water steam or maybe the vapor steam. Now, let us discuss about what will be the characteristics of that HTF so that we can choose that particular HTF for this kind of operations. So, first is that it should have high thermal conductivity, it should have high specific heat capacity, it should have low viscosity, should be stable at high temperatures, environmental friendly, compatibility with other materials like metals, low cost and high durability means the longevity of life. So, now basically suppose I am having that particular liquid. So, how to improve the properties of that particular liquid so that it can satisfy all these properties. So, basically heat transfer performance of the HTF can be enhanced by adding high thermal conductivity nanoparticles to the base fluid. Because as I told already that in a single fluid without mixing or adding anything, it cannot provide these all kind of properties. So, just to enhance that other properties also we are going to add certain kind of nanoparticles which can enhance certain particular properties. So, either that nanoparticles may be a single one, 
means a from a single particular compounds or maybe a combinations of different compounds because as we know that when there is certain nanoparticles it will enhance certain properties but not all the properties sometimes it may happen that it is enhancing one particular properties simultaneously it is decreasing another properties but in that particular case we need increase of that particular properties also so what we will do we are going to add another types of nanoparticles which will increase that particular properties also so the degree of performance improvement depends upon nanoparticle concentrations base fluid particle size and the particle morphology so basically we are having that base htf and nanoparticle we are mixing together and we are making the nanofluids why we are calling it the nanofluids because the fluid containing the nanoparticles in general metallic particles are desirable for a higher thermal conductivity what are nanofluids basically so just let us know a nanofluid is a dilute liquid suspension of particles with at least one critical dimension smaller than 100 nanometer so if we remember that from the nanotechnology point of view there are so many types of nanomaterials designation like 0d 1d 2d 3d so like this that means when we are talking about the nanoparticles that one dimension should be into the nanoscale so basically in this particular case when we are talking about the nanoparticles one dimension from 1 nanometer to 100 nanometer then that kind of particles basically we are using over here so nanofluid is a class of solid liquid composite materials consisting of solid nanoparticles dispersed in a heat transfer fluid so the concept of nanofluids was first materialized by choi it's a name of a scientist after performing a series of research at argan national laboratory in usa researches so far suggest that nanofluids offer excellent heat transfer enhancement over conventional base fluids yes of course because when i am adding third any kind of third party materials so of course it is going to increase certain kind of properties so in this particular image you can see simple i am having that powder i am having that base fluids and i am putting that powder into the base fluids of course up to certain concentration it is not that i am going to add 100 percent maybe 5 percent 10 percent 20 percent depending upon that the performance enhancement if i add more nanoparticles sometimes it may happen that it can reduce all the properties due to the agglomerations or maybe some other problems now how we are going to make this kind of nanofluids there are two primary methods generally we are following one is called the two step method in the two step method first we are having the nanoparticle synthesizer where we are synthesizing our nanoparticles so we are having that nanoparticles then simple i am having one beaker or maybe any kind of flask where i am putting the base fluids and then i am slowly slowly adding the nanoparticles under the continuous steering of by magnetic steerer or maybe any kind of mechanical steerer so we are getting one stable nanofluids over there so first we are synthesizing the nanoparticles then we are adding into the systems that is why it is called the two step method so example a variety of physical chemical and laser bit methods but these methods is having certain problems what is that agglomerations and instability of the nanoparticles in base fluid is the major limitations of this particular method and the second method is of course the one step method so in this method the production of nanoparticles and their dispersion in a base fluids are done simultaneously so if i want to discuss in this particular image so just let me explain that we are having that heated crucible over there right so where i am putting my materials that materials means what materials i am going to add with my base fluids now i am having the liquid circulated throughout it so what happened when i am giving the heat the vapor is generating and that vapor is directly going or maybe come into the contact with the liquids and the nanoparticle is adding into the system so simultaneously both process are taking place in a single step 
So, in this method agglomeration of nanoparticles can be minimized and stability of fluids can be increased. Here is also another good uh, examples like that suppose you are having that liquid, the liquid may be anything that means that liquid is basically your base materials or maybe the base liquid and then you are having one electrode is made by the copper and another electrode is made by the graphite. So, now when you are giving the potential difference in between two what will happen the spark will be generated due to that spark or maybe the electrochemical process what will happen this copper ion will come into the systems that means into the liquid. Now, you are purging the gas what will be the gas say suppose if you purge the oxygen gas. So, automatically that copper will react with the oxygen and it will form the copper oxide and then automatically that copper oxide particle will be inside your system. So, that is also the another advantage or maybe you can say that another approach for making in a single step method. So, in this method the residual reactants like impurities are left in the nanofluids due to incomplete reaction which are difficult to remove that is also one kind of drawbacks, but this method is more convenient than the two step method. Examples like direct evaporation and condensation, chemical vapor condensation and submerged arc synthesis etcetera. Till now we are discussing about what type of process we can make the materials or maybe we can make the HTF. Now, in this particular case we are going to discuss that what kind of nanomaterials basically we can add. So, like we can add like ceramic nanomaterials like alumina Al2O3, copper oxide, silicon carbide Fe2O3, metallic nanomaterials like silver, gold, copper, iron, nickel. If we talk about the alloy nanomaterials like silver copper combinations, like silver aluminum combinations, like aluminum copper combinations. If I talk about the carbon based nanomaterials, we can add the carbon nanotubes, we can add the diamond, of course, this is the artificial diamonds and graphene or maybe the graphite. So, these kind of nanomaterials basically we are adding to the HTF. Now, why? why we are adding this kind of materials because as I told already of course, we are going to increase certain kind of properties right. So, basically our main aim for making the HTF is that it should have very high thermal conductivity. Then only the heat can come from directly to the sunlight to the systems. So, this conductivity because this nanoparticle will make a path so that the heat can come directly into the system. So, the thermal conductivity is the prime factor over here. So, now based on the higher thermal conductivity we are choosing the different types of nanomaterials over here. Say suppose if we talk about the aluminum it is having the 237 watt per meter Kelvin the thermal conductivity and measuring temperature is 293 Kelvin. If we talk about the carbon nanotubes now you can understand what is the difference it has gone up to 3000. So, the maximum k maximum one we are getting from the carbon nanotubes. So, that is why people are nowadays using the carbon nanotubes. Maybe in some recent days maybe some new material will come which will overcome this value also or maybe it will go for the higher thermal conductivity. Now, what are the potential features of nanofluids compared to base fluids? First is that abnormal rise in thermal conductivity, abnormal increase in viscosity, micro channel cooling without clogging, reduced chances of erosions, cost and energy saving and the possible spectrum of applications. So, these all are the features for nanofluids. Now, how to improve the stability of the nanofluids? So, there are several methods. The first one is that controlling the surface charge of the nanoparticles by controlling the pH. So, basically through a high surface charge density strong repulsive forces can stabilize a well dispersed suspension. As the pH of the solution departs from the isoelectric point of particles the colloidal particles get more stable. So, that is the number one conditions. If we talk about the number two conditions then basically sometimes we are using the ultrasonic vibrations by the sonicator right. So, ultrasonic bath 
processor and homogenizer are powerful tools for breaking down the agglomerations. Agglomerations means jolting of the nanoparticles in a certain particular points. Then that vibration will go and it will break that particular jolting and the nanoparticles will be dispersed into the system. Next third one is the modifying the surface by adding of the surfactants. Simple we are doing certain kind of coatings over there. So, nanoparticles due to that high surface energy there is a affinity that they can stick together. Then if I add certain kind of lubrication kind of materials or maybe certain kind of emulsion or maybe certain kind of non-stick materials. So, automatically the nanoparticle will come closer, but they will not stick together. So, that is also the another methods. So, surfactants can modify the particles suspending medium interface and prevent agglomeration over long time periods. So, selection of suitable surfactants and dispersants depends mainly upon the properties of the solutions and the particles. Surfactant molecules adsorbed on the nanoparticle surface can decrease the surface energy and thus prevent the agglomeration of particles as I told already. So, simple the surfactant will attach onto the nanoparticle surface. So, it is non-sticky, so it will not allow to stick the nanoparticles together. Disadvantages at high temperatures uh, that is also the another thing because this is a coating kind of things. So, if you increase or maybe at the high temperature at the, uh, maybe high working temperature rather I say. So, in that particular case what happened maybe that surfactants can come out from the nanoparticles that is a one of the disadvantage of this particular process. So, it will damage and it would not be stable anymore or maybe that surfactants can degrade. So, that is also the problem. Now, what are the physical properties generally we expect from the nanofluids? First one is called the thermal conductivity, then viscosity, density and the surface tension. So, these all are the four properties generally we need for choosing any kind of nanofluids. So, what is thermal conductivity? A nanofluid is a mixture of liquid and nanoparticles and several factors influence on its thermal conductivity. So, factors affecting the thermal conductivity basically what are those? First is that thermal conductivity of base fluid, thermal conductivity of nanoparticles, volume fraction, size of the nanoparticles, shape of the nanoparticles, aspect ratio, temperature and the effect of clustering. So, these all are the factors which basically affecting the thermal conductivity of that particular nano materials or maybe the nano fluids. By suspending the nanoparticles in HTF, the heat transfer performance of the fluid can be improved significantly. The main reasons of such enhancement may be listed as follows like the suspended nanoparticles increase the surface area and the heat capacity of the fluid. Yes, because when you are making that particular materials into the nano size, so aspect ratio which is nothing but the surface to volume ratio is very very high. So, surface area is increasing, surface energy is increasing. So, due to that automatically the more heat absorption will be taking place. Next the interactions and collisions between the particles because you are using number of particles. So, they are suspended. So, when they are moving inside the liquid, so at the time of movement they are colliding each other either may be the Brownian motions or maybe by some other means. So, the fluids are intensified. So, these are the first conditions. Next viscosity. So, in this particular case viscosity is the signs of deformations and the flow of matter right. This is a simple layman description. So, viscosity is an important parameter in designing nanofluids for flow and heat transfer applications. So, the study of the viscosity behavior of a nanofluid also helps to under stand the structure of the nanofluid yes of course because viscosity is one kind of parameters because when the liquid is flowing through the pipe suppose there is certain kind of critical joints or maybe some kind of narrow joints if we i am using certain kind of viscous fluids maybe that viscous fluids cannot enter into that particular joints or maybe into that particular shapes so i need the material which is having the moderate viscosity 
The study of the viscosity behavior of a nanofluid also helps to understand the structure of the nanofluid. The quantities measured in rheological investigations are forces, deflections, velocities and the viscosities. Now, what are the factors basically affecting the viscosity of that particular nanofluids like temperature, particle shapes, particle size distribution, shear rate, surfactant and the volume concentrations. Next third one is called the density. So, the density of a nanofluid which is nothing but the universal nomenclature rho is the weighted average of the base fluid and nanoparticles densities is calculated according to the Peck and Coase equations. What is that particular equations? Rho is equal to 1 minus sigma rho f plus sigma rho p. So, where rho f and rho p are the densities of base fluid and nanoparticles, sigma is the volume fraction of nanoparticles in the base fluids. Yes, of course, because now here in this particular case you are having two systems one is the liquid, one is the nanoparticles. So, you have to calculate both the densities joined together, then only you are going to get the overall densities of that particular nanofluids. So, the density of a nanofluid is a linear function of volume fractions, because if you increase the quantity of the nanoparticles, automatically the density will change. If you add more liquid to the systems, automatically the density will change. So, that is why it is called the linear function. So, for typical nanofluids with nanoparticles at less than 1 percent volume fraction, a change of less than 5 percent in the fluid density is expected. Now, you can see that little bit changing how much change in the density. So, this is basically the thumb rule. Now, what are the factors which affecting the density of the nanofluids like volume concentrations, density of base fluids and the density of the nanoparticles. So, these three factors. Now, we are going to discuss about the surface tensions that is also an important parameter. So, surface tension increases both with particle concentration above a critical concentration and particle size for all the cases. Yes, what is surface tension? I can give you one examples. Suppose, if you dip your finger into some milk or maybe into some oil. So, what will happen? After taking it out, you can see that milk or maybe the oil is attached with your finger. So, that is basically due to the surface tensions in between your finger and in between your oil or maybe the milk. So, that phenomena basically is known as the surface tension. So, this is because the van der Waals force between particles at the liquid or maybe the gas interface increases surface free energy and thus increase the surface tension. At low particle concentrations, addition of particles has little influence on surface tension because of the large distance between the particles. Yes, of course, because low concentration means particle is getting free area for movement, but if you increase the particle concentration, so automatically the particles will come closer. So, automatically the surface tension will change. Now, what are the factors that affecting the surface tensions like nanoparticle concentrations, then size of the nanoparticles and last one is the surfactant that means, if you are going to use any kind of coating materials or not. Now, what are the potential mechanisms of enhancement in thermal properties of the nanofluids? So, first is called the motion of the nanoparticles because in the liquid systems you are having the nanoparticles. So, movement of the nanoparticles inside the fluid. Second, liquid layering at liquid particle interface. So, you are having the nanoparticles, then how the liquid is coming into the contact with your nanoparticles. Third, nature of heat transport in the nanoparticles, how the heat is moving inside the system from one particle to the another or maybe particle to the liquid. Next, effects of the nanoparticle clustering that means, the agglomerations of the nanoparticles. In this particular case, so last one is the coupled transport phenomena, which is nothing but depends upon the heat transfer and the mass transfer of that particular fluid with the nanoparticles one. Now, first one we are going to discuss about the motion of the nanoparticles. So, as I told already, when we are increasing the concentrations of that particular nanoparticles, so automatically there will be a collisions in between the nanoparticles, what you are seeing in this particular image. So, collisions between the nanoparticles leads to energy exchange among the 
nanoparticles. Say suppose the heat is coming from these sides. So, automatically the, this side nanoparticle will be more heated up than these sides when they are colliding each other. So, from higher temperature nanoparticles the heat is going into the lower heat affected nanoparticles. So, like this way the through collisions the heat is transferring from one nanoparticles to the another. This energy exchange result in an enhancement of the thermal conductivity of the whole system. Such collision arise from the motion of the nanoparticles. Even without collisions the Brownian motion of particles might enhance the thermal conductivity. So, the Brownian motion is taking place. Brownian motion could have an important indirect role in producing the particle clustering that could significantly enhance the thermal conductivity. So, that is also the another important indirect role of the Brownian motions of the nanoparticle which produce the particle clustering. There is, that means, one particle tries to go to another place. So, like this way the heat is moving from one place to the another. Next second one is the liquid layering at liquid particle interface. So, basically liquid molecules are known to form ordered layered structures at solid surfaces. These interfacial layers have different thermophysical properties from the bulk liquid and the solid particles. Because of the ordered structure of the nano layer, it is expected to have higher thermal conductivity than the bulk liquid. Although the presence of an interfacial layer may play a role in heat transport, it is not likely to be solely responsible for the enhancement of the thermal conductivity. Yes, of course. Now, the problem is that suppose you are having that nanoparticles, you are having that liquid. Now, the layers are forming onto the surface due to the interactions of that nanoparticles with the liquid. So, now in this particular image you can see the inside one is the particle, then we are having that base fluids and in between the base fluids and particles one interfacial layer is forming basically. So, which is nothing but called the nano layer. Also, if you are using any kind of surfactants on top of that also, that can act as an interfacial layer also. So, now how the heat will move from your liquid to the particles or maybe particle to the liquid that also depend upon this intermediate facial layer which is nothing but your surfactants. So, that is also an important considerations. Next third one is called the nature of heat transport in the nanoparticles means which way the heat is transferring into the systems. Macroscopic theories assume that heat is transported by the diffusion method basically. In crystalline solids heat is carried by phonons that is by the propagation of lattice vibrations. So, simple the vibration is taking place in between the phonons. So, due to that vibration the heat is producing. When the size of the nanoparticles in a nanofluid becomes less than the phonon mean free path, phonons no longer diffuse across the nanoparticle, but move ballistically without any scattering. So, it will run away in a very high speed. So, it is difficult to visualize how ballistic phonon transport could be more effective than a very fast diffusion phonon transport. So, in this particular case, in this case you see the heat is increasing to the top right. So, it is called the diffusive process. So, these all are red dots all are the phonon. So, basically you see the heat it is following certain path that means it is having some nanoparticles. So, one particle to another then this particle to this particle, this particle to this particle. So, it is making one kind of path by the diffusive. Actually that another way I can say that diffusive is the bulk phenomena and the ballistic is the nano phenomena. So, in this particular case what happened? When we are talking about the nano fluids or maybe the nano materials that time the nano material size is too small. So, it is getting some free path in between the particles to go through from one place to another. So, if it is having suppose I am having two balls one is the bigger football and one is the smaller ping pong ball. Now, I am having so many balls over there. So, which ball will be easier to go from one place to another of course, the small ping pong ball. So, in this case also the same thing is happening in the ballistic case. So, the phonon it is very easy to triggering out and go to another place due to its small size. So, 
if we talk about the quasi ballistics, it is nothing but the mixing of the diffusive process as well as the ballistic process. So, both phenomena the heat is transferring. Next, effects of the nanoparticle clustering. So, if particle cluster into percolating networks, so basically this is following the percolation theory or maybe the percolation networks, sometimes we are calling it, they create path for high thermal conductivity. So, it is advisable to have nanoparticle clustering to an extent, means sometimes it may require that nanoparticle can stick together, but not all. A few nanoparticles into different places, generally we expect that it should cluster and generally it happens actually that without knowingly or unknowingly also we cannot destroy that particular agglomerations. It will be always there inside the systems. An increase of thermal conductivity can take place if the particles do not need to be in physical contact, but just close enough to allow rapid heat flow between them. So, in this particular case, you see the nanoparticles with different size has been agglomerated together and how the heat path actually is generating in between that. Clustering leads to settling small particles out of the liquid and creating large regions of particle free liquid with high thermal resistance. Next is the last one that is called the coupled transport phenomena. So, basically in a nanofluid system there are two or more transport process that occur simultaneously like heat conduction in dispersed and continuous phases, mass transport and the chemical reaction either among the nanoparticles or between the nanoparticles and the base fluids. Yes, of course, sometimes it may happen that nanoparticles can react with the base fluid and make some new compound. So, while the coupled transport is well recognized to be very important in thermodynamics, it has not been well appreciated yet in the nanofluid community. So, scientists actually basically do not expect that this kind of coupled transport phenomena because it is very complex one and also it needs lots of research. So, because of the complexity and contradictions in nanofluids, the research community has not reached a solid conclusions on these particular mechanisms. Then what are the advantages? So, basically nanoparticles enhance the heat transfer rate of the base fluids. Till now we have discussed all these points. Second, it is going to reduce pumping power as compared to pure liquid to achieve equivalent heat transfer rate because it is consuming the more heat by applying the nanoparticles into the system. Third one, it reduced particle clogging as compared to conventional slurries thus promoting system miniaturization. So, the problem is that in this particular case we are using certain kind of surfactants so that nanoparticles cannot stick. So, it is giving the better heat conductivity or maybe better heat flow into the system than the macro or maybe the micro particle. Last adjustable properties including thermal conductivity and surface weight ability by varying particle concentration to suit different applications over there. Now, of course, there are certain disadvantages. What are those? First is that nanoparticle dispersion and agglomerations already we have discussed. Nanoparticle sedimentation stability, yes of course, after certain time due to the gravitational force that if it is he very heavier than that particular liquid, so automatically the nanoparticles will come down and settle at the bottom. Third increase in nanofluid viscosity that is also a one kind of disadvantages over there, it should not be because if it will be more viscous then after certain time it will be very difficult to pass through the pipe or maybe the channels. Nanofluid cost, of course, we are adding certain kind of nanomaterials, also we are pulverizing the nanoparticles into the small, small parts for make it more effective. So, automatically the operating cost for making that nanofluid is increasing tremendously and last one is the scale up capacity. Because if it is very less for the research purpose, we can make the nano uh, fluid adding the nanoparticles very easily and the cost will be cheaper. But from the industrial point of view, when I am increasing the quantity of the nanofluid, so automatically same percentage of the nanomaterials I am going to add into the systems, automatically the overall cost is going to be increased. So, these all are the different disadvantages that choosing of the nanomaterials for adding into the nanofluids. 
So, basically people are trying to work on these things and hope in near future they are going to solve all these kind of problems or maybe some newer materials will come which will be give the better properties and will solve these kind of problems. Now, what are the applications? So, basically we can apply this kind of nano fluids into the nuclear systems cooling, electronics cooling, cooling in microchips, HTF in solar thermal systems, medical applications and industrial cooling. But still there are also some possible areas where the scientists are nowadays using this HTF. So, basically this is good for exchanging the heat from one system to another. Now, we have come to the last part of this particular lecture. So, in summary we can say that heat transfer fluids needs to collect, transport and exchange heat obtained from solar radiation. Heat transfer performance of HTF can be enhanced by adding high thermal conductivity nanoparticles to the base fluid. Nanofluids can be synthesized by one step method or maybe the two step method. Controlling the surface charge of the nanoparticles using ultra sonications adding surfactant makes the nanoparticles stable in base fluids. Also, it will make a barrier in between the agglomerations of the nanoparticles. Collisions between the nanoparticles leads to energy exchange among the nanoparticles because it is transferring the heat from one place to another or maybe one nanoparticle to the another nanoparticle. Percolating networks create path for high thermal conductivity in nanoparticle clustering. But still I am telling that so many research is going on basically onto the nanofluids for making it more stable, less agglomerations of the nanoparticles and more heat conductivity so that it can absorb the more heat so that the overall efficiency of the system can be increased. Thank you.